Hello and welcome to another video on Strutty News TV. We're going to reflect on last night's win. Manchester United steamrolling. Um, yet again, good form is picking up and momentum is building. Just um, to introduce the panel today, we have Becca. How are you, Becca? How are you? How's everyone? Not, not too bad. And Leah, how are you keeping? Yeah, good, mate. All good. Johnny, your first time on the show. How are you? I'm good. Looking forward to it. Brilliant. So I suppose at, at the moment, you know, looking at four Manchester United fans, we're all very positive. Um, team are playing very, very well against Brighton again last night. Um, just trying to breeze past their opponents. And I think a lot of people would say, oh, it's only been Sheffield, it's only been Brighton. These are exactly the teams in which Manchester United have been struggling against. And you look at our position in the table and it's because we haven't been able to put these teams away. It's not against our record against the top six. That speaks for ourselves. So I think if we can continue this consistency, there's no reason why we can't get top four. Just quickly to, to reflect then on the overall performance, Lee, I know you did a video on YouTube on, on, on some Matic um, analysis, but the overall performance, we'll get into Matic. What did you make of it? It was, you know, every player started pretty much played well. Yeah, um, for me, um, best performance uh, from United I've seen in a long time. I'm trying to think of one uh, performance that I've seen, which um, last night I didn't feel like United were ever not going to lose that game. If you know what I mean? Like, you know, they were they were solid from start to finish. They completely controlled the game. Um, so, yeah, very good performance. Really happy with it. I think it's been the best one we've seen in, in, in a long time for sure. Just something Danny Higginbottom picked up um, on Twitter during the game, Jonathan, he was talking about the midfield partnerships. We've all been very excited about Bruno Fernandes and Pogba, but Fernandes, funnily enough, was very quick to kind of rubbish that the whole focus should be on those two after the match. He made it clear that as a leader, that the focus should be on all the players putting in a, a team effort. Do you think that with this team now kind of gelling, the partnerships forming, that we really are seeing some real progression and it's exciting ahead of the, the remainder of the season. And can we do something maybe more damage next season? Um, yeah, there's definitely an improvement in the middle, 100%. Obviously, Bruno's transformation of the team has not, has not been um, you know, shy in, in making itself known. Um, for me, obviously, like you, like you just touched on, Matic's performance last night, I think, was, was crucial. I think Oli has established his not just his best start in eleven, but also uh, his best shape in the middle of the park, which I think is a hundred percent. It's a single pivot. Uh, whether that's Matic, McTominay, or Fred operating as a single pivot, that system works best. It allows us to utilize width. With that width, too, you know, there's a number of attacking players. We we went into this season that we weren't quite a hundred percent sure of, um, because their records didn't really stack up. That they they warranted to be leading United's front line. I'm talking about Rashford and I'm talking about Martial. This season they've shown that they can take that responsibility. Um, Rashford obviously didn't score again last night, and I don't think we should be too worried about that. But Jonathan, do you think that that Martial this season is maybe staking a claim that he can be our leading man up front, and we don't need to send a striker in the summer? Uh, I mean, there's still inconsistencies with Martial you know great to see the hat trick in the form but he was a little bit isolated and not really in the game last night maybe that's more to the way Brighton set up they he looked quite crowded but I think for me the biggest thing was Gallo coming in it's kind of almost giving Martial that little step up because when you're the only striker there there's not really anybody to feed off or any competition whereas Gallo came in he's got Five in four starts. There's that hunger about him to do well, and that I think is bringing Martial forward. There's still work to be done, but I'm impressed with what I've seen. He's looking more hungry. He's making better runs. And again, I think we talked about Fernandez, but again, Fernandez coming in. If you're a striker and you're not receiving passes, the ball's not moving forward. You end up not making runs because you yeah. don't see the point. Fernandez coming in has changed the whole dynamic that. Martial suddenly moving more. He knows the ball can arrive. And he's hit 19 goals. So we could be on for two strikers hitting 20 goals a season. Which Probably is really good. first time in about 10 years. Yeah, exactly. Really, really good. Um, Rebecca, just talking about a Gallo there, touching off from Jonathan here. Um, Gallo's come in. I think he's 
definitely uh, exceeded expectations in, in what he's done. He's been very, very consistent. I wasn't against the transfer. I thought at the time we needed someone to come in as an experienced centre forward, not just to, for the young lads to learn from, but also to kind of take some pressure off their shoulders and being able to come in and score goals. But as far as I'm concerned, he's done that more than anyone expected. Um, there's definitely a chance that, that, you know, going into these remaining games, we have to win every game. But Socha can rely on starting the Gallo in a game or two, can't he? Like he sta- oh, he scored yeah. in pretty much every start. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, the thing with Gallo is he had something to prove coming in here. Um, mm. That's what you need from a United team. You need that intensity. You need that drive. And we have that now from Gallo and we have it from, from Fernandez as well. So it is just... It's like watching a completely different team since before lockdown. Like it's 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 just so nice to see hungry players and players who really want to move forward and and, and get get results. Yeah, I, I think that that's kind of sums up the job and what Solskjaer has done. He's made this team a very very likable team, a team that you can see is grafting, fighting for one another, and playing football the right way. We're talking about the combinations being formed in midfield. Um, the right hand side last night, seeing Juan Vesak getting in some great positions um, up the flank, you know, and it's a difference that a, a multiple a combination of players. That's that's why that difference is, is clear to see. Um, mm. Leah, I just want to focus on, I suppose, some of the a lot of the excitement United you know, fans have. It's a lot of us could be gi- gi- guilty of being giddy, um, and I think to be honest, you can't really blame some of the football we're seeing. But I read last night on Twitter someone saying that Soldier needs to make um, Fernandez captain. He needs to do this. And I was kind of thinking, after a performance we watched last night, 3-0, you don't have to pluck at every game and try and get these little negatives out or something to complain about. To have a winning team with Solskjaer wants to build, you need multiple characters. Harry Maguire has put no foot wrong in terms of being a leader on and off the pitch. Why, why is there this kind of sense that Solskjaer has to change everything the whole time? Can you, not as a case of why change it if, or why, why fix it if it's not broken. I think that's a classic case of fans, um, you know, being happy with with Bruno. I think that's all it is. You know, they they love him so much that he needs to be the captain. You know, he needs to be the star man. And you know, it's, I, I take that with a pinch of salt. I think that that view is probably quite limited to uh, Twitter. That says it all, really, doesn't it? That that view <laughs> is quite limited to Twitter. Um, Jonathan, the. The game again last night, obviously, it, it's lovely to watch United kind of really push aside and sweep away these kind of lower league teams. Like I said at the beginning of the, the show, it's been a problem this season. We haven't been putting those teams away. Do you believe this is this is a, kind of a, a real change of the corner? Do you reckon this is going to be the case now between the end of the season? Or do you think that we sh- should refrain from excitement? I'm sort of torn because I went into this game knowing we'd never even got as much as a point away at Brighton in the two years prior you know we'd lost both games we had to look good and then we came in yesterday we blew them away we blew Sheffield United away the midweek we weren't so great against Norwich but we've spent so long maybe seeing we had the odd false dawn with Van Gaal where we had that two or three against Bell against City and against Spurs where we looked like we were really turning the corner and then it just went backwards again we had it when Ole came in and then again we regressed and ended up finishing sixth so yeah. I think there is optimism because the side looks like it's transformed and he's changed a lot of characters in that dressing room. Certain characters who've been around have gone out and he's got players of a certain mentality. And I go back to the talk about making Bruno Fernandes captain. I think if you were to ask Ole, he'd say he wants more than one captain. Yeah. He wants multiple leaders on that pitch because, yeah, Maguire's the club captain. Maguire can lead the defence, but then you've got Bruno further advanced another leadership type of player. So I think that would be the kind of mentality Ollie is looking for right across the pitch rather than Because, saying, Jonathan, if you look at the teams Ollie played in, the successful teams he played in, there was multiple characters. It's, it's, it, a, lot, a lot of the, man, the man, trends of management I've seen um, in terms he came out the other day saying that he does want to sign another centre-forward. It's like an issue, uh, an issue warned to the, the strikers at the club that he will be bringing in another player, which is fair enough. But if you think back to when he played for United, Ferguson would often have four, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> four options, um, four strikers, either two on the bench and two starting. So that's kind of the environment in which he experienced at United. And I wouldn't be surprised if he wants to have that competition in his own team because it was so successful for Ferguson. 
I think that's part of it. And I think he realises, as we talked about with protecting with myself, if you know your place is secure, you kind of maybe you lose a little bit of that motivation. Whereas you know, if you haven't scored for three or four games and there's somebody else underneath who, when they come in, they're doing well and they're pushing and pushing and trying to get that start, you've got to be at a certain level just to keep your place in the side, never mind anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And the good players won't look at another striker and say, well, why do they need him when he's got me? They'll look and say, this is great. We've got a quality squad. It's competition and it keeps me on my toes. And I think Marcel's embraced that. I think having the number nine shirt back, people will say it's a, a fast everything else, but it really did seem to wind him up. When, well, Everett's Everett's when, punditry last night. He he briefly touched on it in Sky Sports. He was with um Anthony Martial on international duty with France when Martial got the phone call to say that United you know, wanted to take the number nine shirt and give it to Slatan. And Martial apparently said no, absolutely not, and he wasn't happy about it. But Soldier kind of, or not Soldier, ever brought up in commentary to kind of. Kind of, I suppose, bring up the relationship Soldier has with Martial, how it's a lot of a better bond than what was had when Mourinho was in charge. And I think we talk about his rise of prominence, Martial. A lot of it's to do with the the environment of Manchester. You, you you almost feel the Soldier is there with a certain number of players putting the arm around the shoulder, and ensuring that he does his bit to to make them feel happy, and then they get the performance out of him. I think that was non-existent with Jose Mourinho with a number of characters who needed it most. Um, Henrik Mkhitaryan maybe as well, a player that just couldn't settle and that was criticised by Mourinho, um, perhaps off the record, but he wasn't happy with Mkhitaryan because he was struggling with the conditions in England, the cold weather and the rain. But, you know, you can, you can complain about that. I understand someone complaining, but you've just spent a good few million on that player. So maybe go, oh, maybe work that a little bit harder with him, put the arm over the shoulder, make him comfortable. And if he's performing, it works. Your team is winning, scoring goals. Kill more flies with honey. Exactly. You know, I look at Mourinho's management. And people wonder why the special one is not so special anymore. You see mm. so many players falling out. You see Tangai Dembele. And I'm not saying Mourinho was always at fault. I believe Paul Pogba was quite pop- problematic when um, the two of them clashed. And it got quite toxic. But Mourinho, wherever he goes, there's constantly trouble. There's constantly a bit of bitterness. And you look at the last few years and Liverpool's rise, we haven't even mentioned the fact they've won a title. I don't want to talk about it, but their rise to prominence too. Have you ever heard of, have you heard of many players that Klopp has fallen out? I remember Diane Sturridge, he got fed up over, but he was a lost cause. You know, so it's, it's very calm. It. Yeah. I'm, very... I'm in my head and I was thinking, I'm not going to say it, but you can see the transformation in that Liverpool team because they're being, you know, supported and, not only on the pitch, in the dressing room, emotionally, you know, they're, they're, like that has a huge impact on like everything to do with a player. Like if they're happy, they're going it to perform. It does nowadays. And I think nowadays you think of anyone in any field of work, um, footballers or anyone. I think people talk about previous years and times when they might not got as much respect in work and you kind of was hard, a lot of hardship and people just got on with it because it, it was work. I don't think people take as much shit nowadays. Um, and I think a certain type of management is is needed with top players. You can't just come in and be this real kind of you know iron fist and and be hard on everyone. Some players maybe need more looking after, and that's just that's just the way it is. If you ha- you have to get with the times. Mourinho has not got the times, and the, the trouble you're going to see at, at sort of Spurs this year is going to continue. Leah, you wrote an, an opinion piece last night after the game on Mason Greenwood. Um, it kind of tied in with. A lot of the Sancho reports we're reading now. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think Greenwood's um, performance last night was enough for us to say we don't we don't need a right winger anymore. Uh, I think we do, but it does it does pose the question as to whether or not we need to be considering spending eighty, ninety, a hundred million pound on one. Um, Maybe maybe we should be looking at a twenty thirty million pound backup to Greenwood. Well, if, if Sky Sports is any way true, we might get Sancho for fifty million. Uh, yeah, yeah, and um, 
yeah okay no I that's 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 never going to be the figure regardless of where he goes whether it's United or, or anywhere else 50 million is not going to be the figure we all know it's not going to be the figure it's going to be more than that or it's going to be nothing you know they'll keep him for two years so that's what it's going to be it's either going to be 100 million pound ish or it's going to be nothing uh it won't be 50 million I guarantee that but um I mean <sighs> Greenwood's performance last night was very good and he has been consistently very good when deployed on the right wing. Like The numbers speak for themselves. I think it's something like 11 starts in the Premier League and the Europa League combined, 11 goals, four assists. Like, they're, they're, they're some pretty tidy numbers. Okay, you know, I think we need reinforcements on the right wing. I think it's still one of our weakest areas, but do we need to be looking for uh, you know, a, a 80, 90, 100 million pound player? Possibly not when there are potential alternatives out there for, for, for less than half that. And you know, then we could maybe reinvest those funds in another area of the pitch, which we, we do need, uh, for argument's sake, left back. I really do think it's going to be a market in which alternatives are going to be seeked a lot because we obviously constantly see reports, the big names that are being linked to Manchester United. And we see them, we see a few other names that may not be linked as often. But I think in a, in a COVID-19 market, when teams are looking to maybe cut back on spending, I think you want to see a lot of um, a lot of alternatives signed up rather than first-choice options. Now, I do hope, I hope Sancho was signed. I, I, wa- I watched the game last night and I was thinking, it's can you imagine him on that right flank? Um, I know as good as Green, Greenwood is, he, he's, he's not quite there yet. He's not the finished article and he's going to take a few years of development to get to there. And... I think even if Sancho comes in, Solskjaer will be wary that what kind of player he has in, in Greenwood. He won't want to miss out on on his you know potential ceiling. Really, the the fee, um, Jonathan, you're you're looking at again this COVID nineteen um, kind of market and um, clubs kind of cutting back on spending. Do you think United are perhaps wary of coming out in the media uh, with the headlines of 100 million plus? Because Woodward already addressed this this year about the, the figures. Be careful of what figures you're reading. Um, he made that very clear. Do you think United are, are wary of their reputation in this market? Because it doesn't sound too good if a team is spending you know, crazy money in this period when clubs are really struggling. It doesn't really make much sense. Uh, definitely. I think... United have done all, so much good during this crisis, the way they've handled certain things and, um, you know, the way they've hand, helped with the employees, the way they've helped out with, with everything that they've done has really kind of enhanced their reputation. And I think there's definitely a bit of posturing going on because Dortmund, to me, if, I, if you like, if I had the first job when they, when they came out and said, the price is the price and there's no COVID discount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something along those lines. And this is United States saying, well, you know, we have a price in mind ourselves. Yeah, I think the 50 million was probably a bit of mischief making somewhere down the line. But I think United will have a price in mind. And I do think that we're in a different market now with Ole coming in, that if the player we want can't be bought for, the, for that price, we will walk away. Mm. And I think you'll definitely see Probably mostly on Twitter, people absolutely losing their minds, thinking how have we walked away from this. You saw it even just when the news that Gomez hadn't signed a new contract, ah, oh, the club's recruitment, something, something. And I think it's a situation. But you have to be realistic in the market we're in and say, for any club to come out and spend a hundred million pounds on a single player, when there are literally clubs going to the wall and fighting for their future because of the current crisis, it's just going to look so poor on any club and I think maybe Dortmund are banking on that to keep him but I just don't think Sanchez has at Dortmund anymore yeah and no I, think I, I think so I think, I think the fact that he didn't really feature much after the the league resumed I know it's finished now but he didn't even play the last game of the season I don't think either did he play the last I game of the season didn't play the last two last two you know and didn't even get off I, th- I think these are signs you can't we can't forget in this COVID-19 market too and I wrote about it yesterday Dortmund have plans to sign Jude Bellingham it's going to cost 30 odd million and two days ago they reported losses of 45 million euros after COVID-19 from from playing behind closed doors which is a significant blow they had a surplus of 17 million euros the previous season so it seems to me they're probably in a loss right now they're going to need money 
um, to, to, to get make the signings that they want. Jude Bellingham is the emerging English talent right now, and I think they've come to the assumption that uh, Jadon Sancho wants to move on. This is the part of his career where he moves from Dortmund, and maybe they can get in Jude Bellingham as the next rising star to build the team around, along with Erling Haaland. You know, that's, that's been their model for years, is to get these players and then to move them on. If they can get 50 million for Jadon Sancho, it makes up for the 45 million euro loss. Um, they still make profit off him. And I think United could be playing hardball in that respect. Um, just just before we, we, we go to a quick preview, um, Becca, can you tell me, Jadon Sancho, when you look at the options we have already on the right, the emerging Mason Greenwood, we have Daniel James, who I think is still a lot of improvement to do. But um, do you think Jadon Sancho this summer is, is, is a necessity? A necessity, no. And want, maybe. Um, I think we do, obviously, we, we do need improvements to the squad. If it's going to cost the club more than 50 million, no, no. Um, if it's going to be less, maybe. But I, it would obviously be nice to have new blood in, like, you know, we could see the improvement in the squad once Fernandez came in. You know, new blood always kind of stirs up this kind of um, hunger. And I just find that if it's going to, you know what I mean? If, if it's going to cost financially for, do you know what I'm sorry, I'm, I, I can't even think right now. Yeah, but you um, see, but the thing too is, as you mentioned, the money, he's got two years left in his contract. Mm. You know, either obviously where this is obviously a market which transfers are going to go for a little bit less. It's very yeah. much the buyer's market. It's not the sellers who are setting the price. It's the buyers. It's the other way around now. Mm. And if Sancho only has two years left on his contract, I think United probably feel right now the ball is in their court. Yeah. You know. Hey, I, do you think? Do you think? So I was just going to ask. Do you think we could potentially see um, a negotiation come in where United buy Sancho this window and loan him back to Dortmund for one season? No, I, 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 I think the, Dortmund would love that. Um, I don't think United... W- w- f- well, firstly, as a, from a PR point of view, United know the, the acquisition of Sancho would cause a lot of excitement with fans. And mm. I think if they were to break that news and then to say, well, sorry, lads, he's going to wait a year for it, they would not be happy. Yeah. Because Sancho yeah. is a marquee sign. Secondly, I think Dortmund would like it. Of course, they get to keep him for an extra year. Um but I think Sancho will kick up a stinker and he, he probably wouldn't sign for United on that basis. He'd expect the club to come in and buy him out right now. Um, he stayed there last year. There was some talk about a move. We were told that the Champions League football, you know, not qualifying, ruled, ruled that out, probably did. And we're being told this year that's not really the key factor. I think, he, I think it's got to the stage where he's impatient and he wants to move on now. And if Dortmund play hardball in, re, in response to United's apparent leak, um, I think you're going to have a player very, very unhappy and potentially going yeah. AWOL. Just to get on to the, to the preview against Bournemouth, we, it's, it's essential that Manchester United continue this momentum with the race for top four and to clinch that spot. You're looking at, there's a lot of pressure coming from Wolves, I think. They're just sticking in there. They're getting three points every week. You have Chelsea, who look really, really good at the minute. But you also have Leicester, uh, almost free fall, and hopefully they're dropping points. Jonathan... Are you optimistic about our chances, not just at, against Burma this weekend, but for the race for top four? Uh, I think if you look at the overall running, you have to say that, on paper at least, United have absolutely the best running of all the, the contenders. You know, we play Leicester at home, away sorry, on, the, on the final day, but otherwise we play teams in and around, really, the bottom half of the table. So if you're looking at it like that, you'd have to make favourites. And like I say, Leicester are, the wheels have well and truly come off. Aside from the Aston Villa game, they haven't looked good really since about... Why do you think that is? Because Leicester were going so well before the the pandemic. Uh, And as well as that, we have Leicester actually in lockdown now, which is quite, you know, for, 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 for one particular area to be in lockdown. We've seen it happen in different countries this pandemic. We haven't seen it happen in the UK or, or Ireland just yet? I don't know what caused it. Maybe teams have figured out Brendan Rodgers again. I don't know. Like Vardy only scored really in that Villa game since Christmas. So something's not seen to click there. there They've been as well. 
yeah, again, Madison, he's he's gone completely off the boil. So, because you bear in mind that we were you know we were linked with him for most of this first half of the season at 70, 80, and I think you'd be hard pressed to to see those links come back right now. No, and it, it's almost like he's suffering from the Deli Alley syndrome of of going through a period of of looking really really good, and then almost being shot like he's after being found out. Now, I'm not suggesting that's been the case with Madison because I think his Lip has, has been a lot shorter than Deli Ali's. Deli Ali's shrunk, struggled for a lot longer, and you're kind of you watch him and the spark in which he used to have in games, it's non-existent now. He just doesn't see, seem to completely sh- lost of it. Um, folks, and more on the game, um, Leah Burmout. I know you, to be honest, in the past few weeks in, in your preview analysis on the blog, you've been making some calls in games and and, the, and they've been coming off. So yeah, you're always on the money. Um, for anyone listening, I suppose to this video or watching, any any tips beforehand? The Bournemouth game, uh, I will say. Obviously, this is lineup dependent. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was. I I suspect we'll see um, Aaron Wabasaka getting forward again. Bournemouth look very, very lightweight up against a team which plays wide. Um, you saw that in their last game against Wolves. Triore just tore them apart. Uh, so I would expect to see on Russian fullbacks again, um, possibly an assist from from either side with balls coming in from the byline into the box. Um, I'd like to see Agarlo start for that reason. I think that he would be uh, more of a physical presence for, for someone like Ake than, than what Martial would. Um, but again, lineup dependent. So uh, I would say you'll see a lot of width from United. Uh, very similar, actually, to um, the game last night against uh, Brighton. I would imagine it would be very similar to that. I'll say 4-0. 4-0, big shout. Becca, yeah. is there any players in which that might not feature every week? You know, people are kind of talking about Soldier's best eleven. Is there any particular player that you'd like to, to feature in this game against Burnmouth? I would love to see Fernando start, but I am a bit concerned that he is going to get burned out very quickly. Um, there's a lot kind of riding on him at the moment and, and a lot is kind of falling on his shoulders. Um, obviously, with I do I do kind of find that when Fernando starts and then Pogba comes on mid-game, that's kind of when we see the most kind of, I suppose, action and, and kind of um, and drive there. So that's what I would like to see. Um, Igalo, I would love to see him start um, against Bournemouth. I think that would be a very interesting, especially because he is su- such a big presence as well. Um, a big, strong, strong guy. So yeah, just no, just of, co- of course. And as well as that, I know people would be kind of looking at Anthony Martial and the flying form he's in, and mm-hmm. to keep him playing. But the I think I think Martial kind of understands that a start for for Igalo in a game or two doesn't really disrupt his his kind of his place in the team. Because the guy that was brought in as that kind of more kind of senior figure, um, he he knows that he's second choice and he's quite happy with that. And I think that's that's a massive um, reason why United seem to be doing so well right now because everyone knows their role, everyone's happy with the role, everyone's happy with the time they're getting on the pitch. There's no one complaining about unfair treatment from the manager. And I'm just saying, like I think it's a massive testament to the job Solskjaer has done. He's been manager. This is his first full season, so he's almost half of last season. We'll say a season and a half, and there's been no real clashes per se in the dressing room. I think there was kind of a, a sign of one brewing when Romelu Lukaku was there. Lukaku clearly wanted to leave, but Soldier was quick to to nip that in the bud and and get rid of him. You know, I, I think there was there was some quotes revealed that Soldier wanted to keep Lukaku for this season. He wasn't totally against um, keeping him. And but he decided to leave, but he 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 he's been really kind of been helped by the the work in which Rashford and Martial have done this season and taken responsibility. Jonathan, quickly, um, can I get a pre or a, a prediction from you for the match? Uh, so I think again, land dependent. My opinion is we'll probably see the exact same team that started against Brighton. Like Fernandez obviously came off around the hour, so did Pogba, so did Shaw. So I can't see Ole King in the lineup. Personally, again, I think I'll keep the Gallop. We're struggling. We can't break them down. He'll probably send the Gallo on for that. But our record, especially at home against Bournemouth, has been good. So, yeah, I'm optimistic for this one. I'm going for another 3-0. David, you're on mute. You're muted. Boom. Thank you. I'm going to go with the, the same 3-0. I'm going to go with the same um, lineup as well as that. 
I don't think he's going to change it too much. I think Agallo might come feature again off the bench. He'd be wary of giving the likes of Martial some rest and period, I think. Um, again, he, he doesn't really have to start Martial. I think we're all kind of sure of the, the ability of Igalo. We're confident that he can fill a role. So I think that it, it's definitely up in the air. He may start. Um, so that's 3 nil for me. Before we wrap it up, Becca, what's your prediction? I'm going to bring my Twitter negativity into this conversation. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say um, that David De Gea will not have, if he plays, obviously, um, he won't have a clean sheet here. I feel like his, he's just been a bit off for me at the minute. Um, I'm, I'm going to say 3-1. Okay, well, that's not a bad result. I think Bruno Fernandez's post match um, interview last night, he kind of stated that it was not not just a good result because he scored two goals, but because United you know, concede. Um, and that's, I want to focus a bit on that too, because the games in which I mentioned were in the problem this season, we haven't been pushing these lower teams away. But to, to be winning convincingly by three goals and not conceding a goal, I think it is really good. And you look at the goal difference in the teams that are around us in top four, we're racking up quite a tally. And if it does come down to that, um, it'll be lovely for that to, to see us into Champions League. So that's the video for today. Um, it's the post match video and discussing some Sancho stuff. Follow Stretticast and Stretty News on Twitter. Make sure you subscribe to Stretty News TV and the podcast Stretticast on iTunes and Spotify. Leah, help people follow you. Yeah, so I've got I've got a separate YouTube uh, channel which I use more for geeky analysis so if that's your thing feel free to sub to that channel um and that's just my name leah smith uh, my twitter handle is at l smith uh followed by five underscores great stuff and jonathan how can people find you on the interweb uh yeah so you can follow me on twitter at jk is the one the united content amongst other things uh you'll also obviously find all links to stretchy news and everything that comes through via there Great stuff. And Rebecca, how can people follow you on, on Twitter? If anyone likes uh, cat videos and some occasional Man United news, it is <laughs> at last Becca. Um, so L-A-S-T-E-B-E-C-C-A. Great stuff, lads. Thanks for joining me. And hopefully we'll talk for another three, week, or three points at the weekend. And we'll see you again soon after that match. <laughs>